This is just going to be a conversation because uh, Rudy's made many presentations. We go back a long way, not that long. That, we met, do you want to stand? Is that sit? a demotion or a promotion? <laughs> <laughs> but are we standing or sitting? We can sit. What do you want to do? Stand. Let's stand. Okay. <laughs> I've been sitting. <laughs> okay, so I met Rudy in the men's room after Ted met. And, you know, we're both doing our thing. And. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I just heard his talk on Alzheimer's, and I turned to him and I said, uh, Rudy, is the brain a noun or a verb? I swear to God, he stopped doing what he was doing. <laughs> then he said, I think it's a verb. Okay, and that led to I many... Said, Can I go back to what I was doing? <laughs> <laughs> and that led to many conversations, ended up as the book Super Brain and now a new book that we're doing together called Super Genes. So just la let's start with first Rudy's background a little bit. Rudy is uh, known as the first, one of the first people in the world to discover a disease-related gene. Huntington's Korea, was it? Well, that was the first time genetics was used to find a disease gene, yeah. And, and a then, long time ago. And then discovered the three of the more, uh, three of the four predictive genes for Alzheimer's. Yeah. And since then has actually discovered 100 genes or more. He discovers a gene a week. <laughs> okay. So what I've learned from Rudy is that 95% of disease-related genes are not fully penetrant. Can you explain that? Well, what we would say is that for, for most of the common age-related diseases, you know, Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, that if you look at the genetics involved and the changes in the genome involved, 5% of them may be causative, determining the disease with certainty, but 95% of them involve the combination of lifestyle and genetics together, giving you some power to make a difference. So the study that Alyssa mentioned is kind of moving us in that direction that we can influence the behavior of our genes through essentially consciousness because consciousness influences everything, relationships, social interactions, moods, feelings, thoughts. Just, yeah, simply just a change in perspective, a simple intention about what you want to do in the world or what you want to do today will change neurochemistry and gene activity in your brain. So we call this epigenetics, where you're changing gene activity. So you're born with a certain deck of genes from mom and dad, and some of that will determine your behavior and disease, very small amount, but most of it's up for grabs, meaning that by changing gene activity, you may be able to overcome some of the predispositions you have toward disease or behavior that were negative. So it's very important to understand what's a good gene activity profile. That's why I can't wait to see what the meditation study shows us. So really, again, going back to this idea of the verb versus the noun. You see, we, we all of us who trained in medicine, biology, the sciences, we were trained in reductionism, mm -hmm. which is you look at the parts to explain the whole. But I was thinking, do parts actually exist? Because parts are frozen moments of observation of a moving pattern, aren't they? You always do this to me. <laughs> he, and the thing is, you always come up with a new one that I can't answer. <laughs> but yeah, I would, I would say that in science, we have to, be, we have to do reductionism because you keep digging in to, from the cell to the nucleus to the gene and, and you're understanding interactions at the molecular level especially if you want to do drug discovery. But if you really want to understand how to live a better life and be healthier, you need to look at the whole organism and be more holistic. So I think it's finding that common ground between digging in for those who really need help where you have to use a drug, but for most of us um, where, it's, where genes are not determining disease but lifestyle matters, let's find out what's going to make us healthy by looking at the entire individual and taking into account genetics and um, and uh, in neurochemistry of the No, I, I totally understand that and I also know that the work you're doing in the l just the last three weeks, you've been, tell them about what happened in well, the last three weeks. Well, we have some, uh, some 
a few new papers in press that, on some new Alzheimer's disease genes. And to tell you, I mean, basically the story is, the newest story in Alzheimer's disease is, you heard today about the amyloid beta protein and how there were positive results on that protein after meditation. Amyloid beta protein drives Alzheimer's disease. It triggers it, and I discovered the gene for it a long time ago, when I was about 12 years old. And I was, it was actually my, my thesis work at Harvard. And there's a cascade. Amyloid leads to nerve cells forming what are called tangles, and then nerve cells die. But you can, you can have quite a bit of that happen in the brain and not become demented. What the big problem, this is what the genetics is now teaching us, and we have several papers on this, is that when you have enough pathology in the brain, nerve cells are dying, there's plaques there, the tangles, there's inflammation. The brain overreacts to the pathology. The brain assumes there's an infection. Because 25,000 years ago, we're running around in the forest, if there was all these nerve cells dying, the brain assumed in its primitive way there must be an infection. So, the, so all, the protect, all the, the protective uh, systems turn on, and what's happening in Alzheimer's is friendly fire. Okay, these cells like microglial cells and astrocytes are trying to protect the brain. They think there's something wrong. They're shooting out free radicals to kill an invader that's not there. And by friendly fire, you're killing more nerve cells than the original pathology is what we believe. Genetics is teaching us that, so now that's a new target. Where we, and so anybody who's on antioxidants or trying to limit free radicals um, is probably good for Alzheimer's too, is what this also says. Okay, so can we move now away from Alzheimer's? Yeah. yeah. If we remember. We are, we are speaking to each other right now and uh, having a conversation right now. It's just one way, but, uh, you know, we're getting some kind of feedback. Are we changing genetic activity as a result of this conversation? Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, any stimulation of the mind will create new activity in the brain. All learning is association you always learn by associating the new stuff with the old stuff. And that means that when you make new synapses, you are also changing and strengthening the synapses you already have. So there's all kinds of plastic, flexible changes. Your whole neural network's being reshaped at the chemical and genetic level simply by listening to us right now. And if people are watching this on Ustream out there, somebody in China, their genetic activity is changing? If they're listening, yes. So, um, so then we are not a single mind. I mean, this is a relational embodied process that is pervasive, and uh, we're totally dependent, in a sense, to each, on each other for our genetic activity, most of it, uh, our emotional well-being, our creativity, insights, inspiration, intention, imagination, is actually part of a collective mind, in a sense. Yeah, as, as you observe the behavior of everyone else, this is in turn affecting your own brain uh, neural networks and neurochemistry and genetics, which means that with your own intention uh, of what you want the world to be, what you want to be in your world, your mind will, will, will serve to control your brain. So we always think about brain creating mind, but mind in a, in a feedback loop has to then also control the brain. So we need to take advantage of that and use mind over brain. Since the brain brings you your world, you have a better world by intending that with your mind. And it's important to remember that at every moment because we have that power, but we don't always use it. Is that too big, too long did an that, answer? No, no, it's great because, <laughs> you know, we've, we've been brought up with certain ideas like uh, I was brought up, and I think anybody who's a biologist here who understands evolution other than today we heard Don Hoffman but you know, the entire evolutionary edifice is built on what are called random mutations and natural selection. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with natural selection, but what is randomness? Randomness to me is what I see as random, what could, could be a creative process or self-directed. You know, Menas brought up three very important uh, elements, complementarity, actually Subhash did too. The complementarity, recursiveness, which means feedback, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, what was the third sentience? Sentience, complementarity, and uh, recursiveness. Do you see that as, we, as you look at de novo med uh, mutations, can we 
categorically say that l mutations are random? Well, I think it's really tough to be random, you know, because there's so much inherent self-organization in a system. Probably randomness is probably the toughest thing to have. So I often think in terms of evolution, Darwinism, the idea of random mutations driving everything, it doesn't take into account that in, as we observe the world, we are changing ourselves. Even a, a mom who's pregnant, you know, um, you know, she, if you put the same embryo in two different women, epigenetics and how those genes express themselves, the activity of genes are gonna make two different kids. I mean, they're gonna be similar, but not identical, because one mother may be stressed out, and that chemistry changes the gene activity and changes the baby that's born versus another mother. So there's always the interplay of gene activity that's gonna come into play. So you have to think to yourself that it, as you experience your world, that may be affecting mutations in your genes in real time in life. Some of those can be in sperm, and that means you get new mutations that you didn't get from mom or dad that go to kids. Are they totally random, or are they reacting to how you perceive your world? And this is a big question, I think, going forward in genetics, as, because now we have the ability to see these mutations with whole genome sequencing. And of course, we share genes with other life forms, right? So uh, we've talked about this before, 65% of our genes are the same as a banana, right? Mm. And 80% uh, of our genes are the same as a mouse. Right. So is it the same organizing intelligent consciousness principle that pervades all of life? Well, you, you can argue that that 65% that similarity with the banana allows us to literally communicate with the banana when you eat it. I mean, <laughs> it's not the most civilized form of communication, but... You know, you, we have, the, how may I say this? The banana is making proteins that have receptors in our body because we have, we have common genes together. So when we eat the banana, we are communicating with the banana at the molecular biochemical level. And that, that interaction is also causing self-organizing changes simply by eating a banana. And the more similar you have two things, like us and a banana, the more communication is possible. So, you know, I'm, I'm going... I can't in a, believe I'm saying uh, this either. Yeah, I can't believe you're saying it too. I mean, you get a Harvard neuroscientist with the head of genetics at Mass General Hospital uh, nominated I, I for the Nobel I should have used a different Prize, urinal. That's but I want to ask background. you something else. Do you think what Eastern wisdom traditions call karma mm. okay. ha is, is, has something to do with the behavior of genes, both personal and collective? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I do. I have tenure in an endowed chair. I'm allowed to say these things now. Um, I do believe that. I do believe, I believe in reincarnation. I believe that there's some way we'll figure out, I don't know, maybe a thousand years from now, how a soul picks their next body based on genetic predisposition to disease and behavior to better work off karma. I do believe that. I said it. <laughs> and... And last question. Guys, do know that he's the candidate for the Nobel Prize. No, no, uh, no, come no, on, we know that. Okay? We, you can't deny it's, that. It's all fixed. We know that. So, final question. You know, we, we've heard all this observing self, observing uh, the experiencer. And, of course, you know, these days everybody's talking about out-of-body experiences when we really don't have an explanation for an in-body experience. <laughs> Where is this observer? We're influencing each other's... We should rehearse these questions. Yeah. You know, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> where is the observer? Well, look, you know, I, I agree with you know, what we've heard today, that it, it's, a, it's a universe of consciousness. The brain, there is no outside and inside. Okay, you don't have to worry about whether memories are outside the brain or inside, because the brain is also a construct of consciousness. So it's one system. And the observer... I mean, the fact that we have self-awareness, and this is what we wrote in Superbrain, self-awareness allows us to observe what's going on in our brain. So instead of being just passively going along for the ride of whatever emotions and thoughts our brain wants to hand us, by simply observing it, and that integrates the instinctive brain, the limbic brain, the intellectual brain, and in doing so, you create a Superbrain, as we, as we wrote about in the book. So the, the key is, observe what's going on in your brain, celebrate self-awareness, it's only a four million year old gift, 
and we should use it every single day. And as we do that, you know, and we heard the last talk, 300 million possibly livable planets just next door in the next neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I think by getting to this fundamental level of consciousness, could we be the next uh, agent for the evolution of the universe itself? I, I, I think it's obvious, yes. I mean, if we are, if, if you have a universe of consciousness and we are conscious beings that are, that are affecting the universe, then we are driving our own evolution and thus the evolution of the universe. Yes. I love Rudy Tanz. <laughs>